everyone here today joining us for our first webinar, which forms part of a greater series called Flybox Fundamentals. Today we're going to be speaking about the basic introduction of flux multiply larvae thrust. Some of you might be familiar with flux multiply larvae thrust, others less so, and hopefully there is something for everyone to take home today. To share today's outline on the topics that will be discussed, we'll talk around the use of chemical and organic fertilizers, around FRAS and where that fits into the picture, what is FRAS, the trial data that's coming through on FRAS, the benefits of FRAS, and then also, lastly, how to apply and how to buy FRAS. A little background on myself and what I bring to the discussion today. I have just over seven years of experience in black soldier fly larvae nutrition, in feed management, as well as waste processing and waste preparation, specifically for insect farming. I also have an academic and a commercial background and experience in the application of insect products into various markets, including pet foods, poultry foods, as well as uh, pig foods as well. The webinar today is aimed at those looking for a green, planet-friendly insight and perhaps in the context of product development, academic exploration, or simply looking at those for opportunity in this exciting new space. Taking a look at fertilizers at the moment and the traditionally used fertilizers, both chemical and organic, specifically looking at chemical fertilizers now. There is approximately 1.5 million metric tons in the UK consumed of chemical fertilizers, and this amount has stabilized over the last 10 years. The price of fertilizers has also stabilized recently. The graph that you're seeing in the slide is an indicator of the a number of fertilizers over a period of time, which we see as stabilized of between 300 and 600 pounds per tonne. The reason why chemical fertilizers are traditionally used are because they're easily soluble in water, they're absorbed by plants readily, and so we see that um, they are a very easy way of increasing the outputs um, for the available space or land, um, and this has been really necessary to ensure food supply and food security in a number of areas around the world. However, there are consequences to chemical fertilizers, and we're going to look at five of the main consequences of fertilizers now. The first being increased acidity levels, and this has a consequence on reduced soil biodiversity, as well as the replanting potential of soil. The other is water contamination. This is obviously harmful to humans, to plants and animals, and reducing our groundwater quality, quality is really um, affecting a lot of other sectors in agriculture as well. The third is the overgrowth of plants or technically the misuse of chemical fertilizers. This limits the plant's longevity as well as the plant's endurance to grow and to, to produce crops um, over a number of years. Overall, there is a climate change acceleration effect from chemical fertilizers, and this comes through in evidence of acid rain, in nitrous oxide emissions, um, and all of this really is harmful to a lot of living organisms, including microbes, um, including insects and humans, and the symbiotic effect of that as well. In a similar way, we see chemical fertilizers having the same effect in the body um, of when we use antibiotics in our gut as humans. And antibiotics generally remove both good and bad bacteria. And so we see the same effect from chemical fertilizers in soil in that it doesn't differentiate between good and bad bacteria and microbes, and therefore it really messes with the balance and um, really the natural environment of soil in nature. We're going to look at compost as the comparison for organic fertilizer today and really spotlight compost in today's conversation. Um, and the reason for that is compost takes eight to six weeks to fully decompose. 
um, which really delays its availability in terms of the product and in terms of availability in store. Compost generally is dependent on the ambient temperatures and the conditions of where it is produced and manufactured, um, and therefore it can be delayed throughout the year and does not have a predictable production schedule. This often poses health risks and odor risks because compost is generally produced in outdoor environments, um, as well as being vulnerable to disease vectors and microbial contamination. As a FRAS comparison to date, we look at FRAS that is produced between eight to 10 days. Every eight to 10 days, a new batch of FRAS can be manufactured. Um, and this is a much faster nutrient solution. It acts as a um, very reliable source of um, nutrients due to the fact that um, FRAS is produced by facilities that are climate controlled. Um, there is a stable and really predictable process um, which allows us to make um, market decisions and forecasts very well. Um, apart from this, and I'll bring this more into the FRAS benefits later in our conversation, there is an insect repellent um, property or functional benefit of FRAS, which really talks to mitigating that risk of pests and microbial contamination. So where does FRAS exactly fit in? So we've had a look at the chemical and synthetic fertilizers, which are generally man-made and petroleum byproducts, etc. And um, opposed to that, there is organic fertilizers and compost, which we've just spoken about, um, alternatively manures, alternatively wood ash or guano. And then um, there's biofertilizers. So biofertilizers have a microbiological um, active component to it. And this is where FRAS fits in due to its great microbial immunity. So let's put the spotlight on FRAS specifically. FRAS is made up of three components. The first being larval exoskeletons. The second um, being the unconsumed feedstock or feed residue. And the third being larval excrement. All three of these provide their own functional benefits and their own advantages to being part of FRAS. In general though, FRAS is rich in essential nutrients, specifically nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are the main soil health elements that are being considered in the market. Um, apart from this, FRAS really brings micronutrients, microminerals also to the table and makes it an effective natural fertilizer. The FRAS that is produced also has very um, important soil structure properties and supportive aids in terms of increasing water retention, as well as the improved aeration of soil and foster and microbial activity that also brings about better soil or healthier soil and in increased crop yields. To explain slightly the um, exoskeletons that are part of FRAS, so if you look at the life cycle of the black salt fly larvae, we generally harvest larvae between the fifth instar and pupa, um, and that way they are optimized for that production. But it means that after each instar, a skin is shed from each larvae, and that skin is the exoskeleton that is really rich in minerals um, and great in terms of functional benefits in terms of insect repellents, and that happens after in each insta. So there is a lot of that component in FRAS, which is greatly beneficial. It's a good time now to talk about the, uh, the industry of insect protein and um, insect farming in general. This is a schematic which shows how black soldier fly larvae FRAS could be produced. Um, it, it requires two inputs. The first being a formulated feed of organic wastes, and the second being black soldier fly larvae juveniles, which are loaded at a specific loading density. And organic waste is formulated by nutritionists who are meeting minimum nutritional requirements of black soldier fly larvae. Together, these are farmed in a black soldier fly larvae climate controlled, generally environment, which really 
bodes well for the bioconversion um, and the fostering of feeding behavior by black sulfur larvae to give us two really great products at the end of the day. These two products include black soldify larvae, in, um, which has a high level of protein, which also has a high level of fat, um, and these are greatly used in insect um, diets for pets, for other animals. And then the byproduct of insect protein and fats is black soldify larvae frass. So this is a great way of just looking at how frass is produced. In terms of the insect farming industry, we see that there has been a great growth or remarkable growth in the industry thus far and actually an expected growth of higher than 10% between 2020 and 20, 2030 of compound annual growth rate. And the global demand for insect protein is expected to be around 500,000 tons by 2030. And with all of this insect protein demand comes the availability of frass as well. There's a lot of reasons why frass is great besides for its nutritional value, and we're going to look now at the frass and its exact advantages. Due to the nature of insect farming, the production of frass is agile, meaning it has a quick turnaround cycle time, and therefore there's an ability for us to gear frass for specific use cases. Nutritionists will always optimize substrates to meet larval requirements for growth, which result in a stable product of frass. However, there is an ability for us to dictate and to manipulate the insect protein as well as the frass by manipulating the substrates going into the system. The impact of these substrates on frass, again, is for important to bear in mind when choosing an insect farming partner and also when designing your own insect substrates for your own farm depending on where you're coming from. We generally speak of frass having an average NPK of around 322, often with higher levels of potassium and phosphorus levels in a lot of cases. Um, the mineral levels, however, particularly calcium and magnesium are abundant and really call for a well-rounded product um, when we look at frass on the whole. Frass supports plant health as well as soil health and survival in even the harshest of conditions. And this includes drought um, and really supports a resilience in plants so that they can continue to, to have crop yields um, during the really tough years. Um, it supports erosion and sort of the structure of soil and the root development um, also makes sure that the nutrient absorption is really optimized within a specific um, plant and in a specific soil. The most unique and interesting aspect of frass for me personally is the resilience of frass against negative effects of pests and pathogens. And that is because it really stimulates a plant's natural immune response um, against fungi and bacteria infections. And the community that is found symbiotically thriving between um, that which frass brings and that's already in the soil really allows for a, um, a natural environment of biodiversity in the soil. So the fact that we use feedstocks that are underutilized waste streams for insect farming really already plants us quite well in um, terms of sustainability and sustainable agriculture. The fact that frass then goes on to replace synthetic and chemical fertilizers means that there's a great contribution of frass production and the use of frass against um, contributing to net zero targets. Frass is also odorless. Um, it has a low risk of contamination, is organic and can be organically certified, um, and is a very easy to apply product. There's a few trials available, and we're hoping that this really encourages more academic institutions to come forward with trials, but there is a really abundance of information available for the data on FRAS and the use of FRAS. 
Specifically, this is a study that was done on three different plants comparing organic fertilizer or a combination of compost and manure in the sec um, against frass. And what they've seen is actually amazing. The results are up to 71% higher yield in tomato plants, up to 65% higher yield in French bean plants, and up to 7% higher yields in maize. And interestingly, when in the same study compared to a urea fertilizer, which is a synthetic fertilizer, we see a 27% higher yield coming from the use of frass at the same dosage levels. There is great data coming through in a number of trials. Um, this is a meta-analysis an that's been done by some authors in an open access paper. If you'd like access to this, um, please let us know. We would happily share this with you. Um, but this really highlights both the use of frass in vegetable plants and in grain plants and how those benefits are actually really universal to all plant species that we're seeing being tested on frass. Um, for me, the highlight of this is really seeing, you know, what causes higher crop yields? What is the reason for generally, or what is the causation of generally improved plant health and crop yields? And for me, I break it down to three very interesting parameters. <clears throat> the first being a higher root depth. So the accessibility of nutrients by the roots is improved as well as the photosynthetic activity. And this is from you know, more plants, the higher plant weight being recorded, and therefore the photosynthetic activity is improved for plants in that way. Um, and in general, we'll talk a little bit about how to apply it in your own scenario now. So frass is not a medium that you would use on its own. So just to be clear, frass is a um, a supplement or a soil amendment to existing soil medium. In this slide, we'll talk um, through some of the application or recommended application rates for three different scenarios. The first being an annual crop yield, um, and we're expecting that to be at about 3.5 tons per hectare application rate. In potted plants, at 7.5 kilograms per meter cubed. And then in gardening purposes, 250 grams per meter cube, meter squared. And I'm sure by now you're thinking this is a really wonderful product. How do I get my hands on this? How much does it cost? And you know, where do we start from here? And we're here to bring you some exciting information about availability and cost. In terms of the small scale um, packaging and availability, you can expect to find this in gardening associations and retail shops at around two to four pounds per kilo, making it affordable for trials and testing. And for commercial pricing, up to about a thousand pounds per ton. And this obviously has much to do with where and how much you'll be ordering. So um, in terms of availability, there are production facilities in the UK, which we can introduce you to, as well as in Kenya and many other um, spaces. Now, just a take home message. So this is something I would like everyone to look to. Uh, if you couldn't remember everything else today, these are the four things I would like you to remember today. The first is that frass improves the soil structure and the water holding capacity. The second is the high nutrient value of an NPK of 322. The second is the climate smart agricultural choice of using frass. And this is to do with sustainability. And the last is the very interesting natural pest repellents that frass has and that effect on soil. If you would like the opportunity to see black soldier fly larvae insects being farmed in the flesh, then a farm visit at one of our demonstrators is possible. We do have available slots for this, um, and these are available both in the UK as well as in Kenya. Really do encourage you to um, reach out to our team and discuss this further.